Hello and welcome back. Due to a lack of time I thought I'd try out using an AI narrator. I'd love to hear whether you like it or not in the comments below. Anyway, now that I've optimized my computer, my DAW, and my sample players, I'm going to begin the most difficult task of building a template, which is adding the instruments. As I build this new template I'll need to keep the reasons for building it in the back of my mind, to increase writing speed, versatility, clarity, and tweakability. I'll begin by creating a folder on my desktop and naming it. Then I'll open Cubase. Choose Create Empty, which creates a new project, and navigate to the folder I just created to select it. Then I'll go to the File menu and select Save as Template. Down at the bottom of the new window that opens is the new preset section. I'll enter the name of my template in this field. Next, in the Attribute Inspector, I'll go to the template category and click the value field to select scoring as the template category for this template. Then I'll click OK. I'm also going to save this new project in the folder I created on the desktop so I can experiment with my template and work on it. When I'm satisfied with what I've changed that day I'll go to the file menu and select save as template again, overriding the template file I created. Finally, I can go to file, new project, and then click the tab for scoring. Here I'll find my new template file and I can right click it to select show in explorer. This reveals the file's location so I can occasionally back it up to a flash drive. For me on a Windows 10 computer, this is located here. This is where the difficult decisions begin. Step 1, I'll start my template by including only the most common orchestral instruments. For example, the basset horn, flugelhorn, and saxophone are not commonly seen in orchestral literature and are rarely included in sample libraries dealing with full orchestral sections. If you are building your template with me, you need to decide which orchestral instruments will be included in your template and which ones won't. You will also have to make many more decisions based on your personal preferences. Expect your template to change over time so don't worry too much about this step. If you find you want to add more instruments to your template, you can always do it later in the same way that we'll add these instruments in this episode. Step 2. I'll set up the order of instruments in my template to generally reflect the order a person might see them in an orchestral score. Woodwinds at the top, then brass, then percussion, and finally strings. The order of instruments in my template will also appear from the highest instruments down to the lowest instruments. This varies sometimes from what you might see in a traditional score but it works for me. Step 3. I'll take an inventory of all the libraries I own and then make a list of every single articulation that's available in every library. Step 4. I'll decide which instrument libraries I want to use, specifically, I need to decide which libraries are going to be my primary libraries which will be the default libraries in my template. Other libraries I own can be added later and can either be used for doubling this library or for when I need a different sounding section or different articulations. I'll also add solo instruments later. Step 5. I need to decide whether I'm going to primarily use a single multi-articulation patch for each instrument or several separate articulations loaded into a single contact instance for each instrument. There are advantages and disadvantages for each method. Regarding using a single multi-articulation patch, the advantages are having much fewer tracks in your DAW. The disadvantages are that some libraries may not allow layering articulations or poly key switching in a multi-patch, like a staccato articulation layered on top of a legato articulation for more bite on the attack.
you cannot apply signal processing to the articulations independently of each other. Some libraries use inflexible key switches in their multis that cannot be moved. I can't mix articulations from different libraries in the event I don't like a particular articulation from a library, for example, some libraries do not include pianissimo samples. And finally, using a multi doesn't allow me to offset timing differences between articulations, otherwise known as adjusting the timing of different articulations using negative track delay. To fully understand what negative track delays are and how they're used we'll need to define what lag times are. Every acoustic instrument has lag time. The question is how much. Lag time is defined in milliseconds and describes the time interval between the initial attack of a note and how long it takes that instrument to bloom into a full sound. To demonstrate this, let's take a look at waveforms that are rendered from staccato samples that are quantized on the beat. Notice there is some ramp up time before the full bloom of the notes. Many instruments have slow attacks and a short ramp up to the full attack as the performer has to play slightly earlier to get the full attack to sound on the beat. This is because of things like the time it takes for the cavity of an instrument, especially a large one, to fully resonate. Since a performer has to start notes slightly ahead of the beat to get them to sound on the beat, we must do the same with sample libraries. Notice how this passage sounds better when shifted slightly ahead of the beat. Another cause of sample library timing issues involves legato scripting. Legato patches employ scripting that triggers true legato transitions between notes but only when those notes are overlapped. Notes that don't overlap do not trigger true legato transitions. Therefore, some latency is induced as the computer waits to see whether the next note is being overlapped by the prior note or not. This also means the first note of a legato phrase has less latency since the start of the note is not overlapped, but subsequent overlapped notes will have more latency as the computer waits to see what you will do next. Listen to the rendered audio waveform of this quantized phrase. Notice how the first note is closer to being on the beat while all the rest of the overlapped notes are late. Now listen to the phrase again as I shift it ahead of the beat. Now the first note is too early but the rest of the overlapped legato notes are on the beat. To address this, composers spend an inordinate amount of time moving notes ahead of the beat to get the timing of the notes to sound correct. It's a complicated problem since there are timing differences between different articulations within a library, short articulations like staccatos have very little latency while long articulations like legatos have a lot of latency.
One solution to this problem is to compensate for these differing latencies by setting discrete negative track delays in your DAW for each articulation. Negative track delays cause notes to be triggered ahead of the beat so they sound on the beat. The computer accomplishes this by taking advantage of the lag time between when play is pressed and when your DAW actually performs the notes. So, for example, a staccato articulation might have a negative track delay of minus 20 milliseconds, which will trigger the note 20 milliseconds earlier than where it is on the grid. On the other hand, a legato articulation might be set to have minus 190 milliseconds of negative track delay, causing the note to be triggered 190 milliseconds earlier than where it appears on the grid. Listen as I set the negative track delay on this multi-track to minus 20. The staccatos sound on time but the legatos are off. Next, I'll set the negative track delay to minus 190 and notice how the legato notes are on the beat, except for the first note which has no legato, but the staccatos are rushed and ahead of the beat. Unfortunately, it's not possible to have independent negative track delays when using a multi, which means I'll be spending a lot of time manually moving notes ahead of the beat to get them to sound on the beat. As I said before, I'm all about efficiency and speed in this new template so this approach isn't going to work. Incidentally, I first learned about negative track delays from David Kudel and it's a game changer. If you would like to learn more about negative track delays, I highly recommend checking out David's excellent YouTube video on it here, as well as his negative track delay database found here. Regarding the use of several separate articulations loaded into a single contact instance, the disadvantage is that it can create an enormous amount of tracks. The advantages are that I can easily layer articulations, I can apply signal processing to each articulation independently, I am not stuck with key switches that cannot be moved. I can mix articulations from different libraries easily. And I can set negative track delays independently for each articulation. Because of the flexibility it offers and the time saved moving notes, with very few exceptions I'm going to set up my template using this approach. Step 6. I'll need to choose how I'm going to trigger my articulations. My triggering choices include velocity, key switches, changing MIDI channels via key switching, program change messages, control change or CC messages, expression maps, and color. Let's review each of these triggering methods now. Different articulations can be triggered by velocity, or how hard you strike the keys on the keyboard. Low velocities will trigger one sample while higher velocities will trigger a different sample. Velocity triggering is usually used with short articulations like staccato where softer velocities trigger lower dynamic staccato samples and harder velocities trigger higher dynamic staccato samples. This is how I will use velocity triggering. Key switches are keys assigned outside the normal range of an instrument to trigger articulations. In this multi, for example, watch the on-screen keyboard as I trigger different articulations with the key switch keys on my keyboard, which are colored pink. Switching articulations using key switching doesn't make a lot of sense since I won't be using multis. Key switch data is also recorded on the key editor. This can be problematic in three ways. First, if I transpose a part it will also transpose the key switch data as well and the right articulations won't trigger.
Second, if I copy a phrase and then paste it elsewhere and didn't also copy the key switch data the right articulations won't trigger. And finally, if I convert my score to notation I'll have to manually delete all the non-musical key switch data from the score. As you saw earlier, I can load a bunch of single articulations into a single contact instance that have separate MIDI channels and then create a bunch of MIDI channels just below that instance. I can then independently record my separate articulations by changing MIDI channels. While this makes it possible to have independent reverb, EQ, and negative track delay on each channel, it creates more tracks than I want in my orchestral template. So this will not work for me either. A hybrid solution to be able to use key switches with several separate articulations loaded into a single contact instance involves changing MIDI channels via key switch. This can be accomplished through a free script called KS Router, found here and at the link below. I'll put this script in this folder. Then, when I have several separate articulations loaded into a single contact instance, I'll click the KSP button in the contact player, go to preset, user, and then I'll choose KS router. Here I'll choose the starting note which will be the lowest key switch that I'll choose. Next I'll set the total key switches to the number of single articulations I have in this contact instance. Finally, I'll set my starting channel to MIDI channel 1. Notice every articulation is set to a different MIDI channel. Then I'll click KSP again to close the window. Notice there are no pink key switches on the keyboard. And yet I am still able to switch articulations using key switches. With this setup, there is a way to assign independent EQ, reverb and negative track delay values per individual articulation. To do this, I'll open the output section in my contact instance and add more outputs until I have the same number of outputs as articulations. At this stage I need to be sure to see channel numbers for each output channel. If not, I'll have to manually select them, making sure they are appearing in numeric order. Next, I'll rename those outputs to reflect the order of my articulations. Then I'll go to each articulation's drop-down menu in the output section and select the corresponding output. At this point I'll only hear the legato channel. To hear the other channels, I'll open the right zone in the project window. Click the down arrow for this contact instance, and then select Activate Outputs. Here I'll select as many outputs as I have articulations. Then I'll close the right zone. Now when I go to the mixer I can set the EQ and reverb on each articulation to different settings. I can even install a free plugin called Minus Delay to set independent negative track delays per articulation. You can find the Minus Delay plugin here. To use this plugin, in your mixer window, click the window layout cogwheel and select channel latency. Now all plugin latencies will be shown just above the pan settings. Now, I'll open the Minus Delay plugin on each articulation track I'd like a negative delay on and set each plug into different delay times based on what's required by the articulation. I'll use David Kudel's database to get started on the negative delay times. Notice the legato and staccato notes are now playing on the beat. This is more versatile and tweakable than simply using key switches with a multi but there is still the problem of having key switch data recorded onto the parts. 
I've also found that this plugin doesn't seem to remember its settings when the project is reopened. A workaround I found is recording automation moves to reset it by starting at zero and gradually dropping to the negative track delay I desire on each track. But look how erratic the tempo behavior is as it resets itself. So this may not work either. Program change messages can be used to trigger articulations in contact. To use this function, I'll go to the floppy disk icon and select new instrument bank. Then I'll click the wrench icon to expand the bank and start loading instruments. Now I'll send program change messages via the pads on my keyboard. The benefit of using program change messages is it doesn't muck up my score with key switch data, and it can be transposed with no problems. The drawbacks are that I'll have to make sure to copy the program change data with a musical phrase if I want the right articulation to trigger. Instrument banks also do not allow articulation layering, independent output channels, or independent negative track delays. Because of this, I'll only use program change messages with instruments that have sharp attack transients, very little latency, and don't have legato, like percussion instruments. Some libraries allow you to trigger articulations with control change, or CC, messages. To do this I'll have to set my keyboard up to send CC messages. When in this mode, the articulations change based on their associated CC number. The advantage of using CC numbers over key switches is that I can transpose a score and not worry about key switch data being transposed too. I also don't have to worry about removing key switches from the score. As far as disadvantages, I'd have to make sure to copy the control change data with a musical phrase if I want the right articulation to trigger. Also, this setup seems geared toward multi-patches so I won't have separate EQ, reverb and negative track delay for each articulation. Because of this I'm not going to use CC numbers. Expression maps are specific to Cubase. I'll set up an expression map for my instrument by going to the inspector, clicking the down arrow on expression maps, and clicking the expression map setup button. I'll create a new expression map by clicking the plus sign at the upper leftmost corner of the new window. Here I'll double click, untitled, and name the expression map after my instrument. Then I'll set remote settings to key switches since this particular instrument is set up to trigger articulations with key switches. I'll click the set remote keys button and in this window I'll set the start key to C0 since that's the lowest key switch. I'll also change the key mapping to white keys since my current key switch setup only uses white keys. Then I'll click OK. Now I'll go to the sound slots window and under remote I'll enter the location of the key switch for my first articulation. Then I'll go to the drop-down menu under Articulation 1 and select the articulation that most closely matches the name of the articulation assigned to that key. Finally, I'll go to the Output Mapping section, click the plus sign, and under Data 1 I enter C0 to reflect the key switch I want triggered. After all this, I'll do the same procedure for the rest of the articulations. I'll save this map, name it after the instrument, and close the window. Now I'll select the six horns expression map from the drop-down list under expression map in the inspector. As far as using expression maps, I'll open my horn part in the key editor, and then choose the articulations slash dynamics lane. By using my draw tool I can now trigger different articulations.
There are a lot of advantages to using expression maps. I won't have to delete key switch data on the score, the names of the articulations show up in the score, even when exported to notation programs. Articulations are easily identified in lanes in the key editor, and copied and pasted notes don't forget their assigned articulations when moved. Additionally, I can change the channel, length, transposition, velocity, and range of the instrument for any incoming MIDI data. I can even set up single articulations within one contact instance and select a different MIDI channel for each articulation within my expression map to trigger them. The disadvantages are I have to create and save expression maps for each instrument. Expression map data must be drawn in before or exactly on the beat when a note occurs to trigger the correct articulation, and I'm not crazy about creating more lanes in the key editor. And there is still the individual negative track delay problem. Nonetheless, this has promise. The final way to change articulations is through colors. First, I'll load a single contact instance with multiple individual articulations. Next, I'll play my part in and then I'll set the MIDI channel to any. This is an important step since triggering my articulations with colors won't function correctly without it. Now I'll open the key editor, go to the top of the menu bar, and then right click to make event colors visible. Here I'll go to the event colors drop down menu and choose channel. Now I'll assign a note or group of notes to different MIDI channels by highlighting them and then going to the info line to assign a MIDI channel. Notice the notes change color depending on the MIDI channel it triggers. This is an excellent way to trigger different articulations. Also, unlike expression maps, I don't have to worry about drawing an articulation on or before the beat of a note, since the channel information travels with the note. This makes moving notes and copying and pasting them very easy. The disadvantages are that, unlike expression maps, I don't have visual cues as to which articulations are playing when. Of course, I could create a color key. However, there is still the problem of independent negative track delays per articulation. Fortunately, for both colors and expression map triggering, this problem can be solved through the use of a clever contact script called the Variable Delay Compensator. This extremely useful script was written by KP Music over at the VI Control Forum, and you can download it here. I'll install this script in the same place I installed the KS Router script, located here. Now, on my track containing a single instance of contact loaded with single articulations responding to different MIDI channels, I'll overlap the quantized notes in my legato patch so they trigger legato scripting. I'll also include other articulations. However, legato patches typically have the most lag of all articulations and this will help me determine the maximum amount of negative track delay I'll need to set on my track. I'll loop this section in my DAW to figure out the negative track delay setting that best sounds like it's on the beat. For the moment I'll ignore the first note played in my recorded and quantized phrase, adjusting the negative track delay in my DAW's track, until it sounds like the overlapped notes are performing on the beat. Some settings might vary a little from the negative track delay database so I'll use my ears. If I've done it correctly, the first note will sound ahead of the beat but the rest of the overlapped notes should sound on the beat. In my case, a good setting for the overlapped notes only seems to be minus 190 milliseconds. 
Because the track in my DAW is set to minus 190 milliseconds, all notes are actually being triggered 190 milliseconds earlier than where they appear on the grid. This helps sluggish legato scripting sound exactly on the beat. Next, to set up the variable delay compensator, I'll open my contact instance containing multiple individual articulations and click the KSP button. I'll go to preset, user, and select variable delay comp version 1.5. At the bottom right of the script I'll change the channel drop-down menu to the channel equals algorithm mode. In this mode, each MIDI channel is only affected by the algorithm of the same number. So, algorithm 1 affects MIDI channel 1 only, algorithm 2 affects MIDI channel 2 only, and so forth. This mode ignores any rules set in the lead conditions window. Therefore, I'll go to the lead conditions drop-down menu and change it to lead algorithms. Next, underneath the algorithm drop-down menu, I'll set the legato lead to 190 milliseconds, which will be the same number as my negative track delay setting without the minus sign. I should mention here that what we call negative delay the developer calls lead time, as in, how much earlier, or ahead of the beat, do we need a note to be triggered relative to its location on the grid to sound on the beat. What we are asking the script is, how much do we want the triggered note to precede or lead ahead of the beat so the sound occurs on the beat. There are a couple of reasons I'm beginning by entering numbers into the legato lead field. Legato scripting has the longest latency and the number I enter in this field effectively calibrates any other numbers we enter, doing all other math calculations for us relative to this number. This is the maximum lead time we will need for this instrument and it's based on the sluggish legato scripting. Notice the number in the upper right corner of the VDC now says 190 milliseconds, reflecting the maximum lead time the script will use. Another reason to set the legato lead first is related to how the VDC works. According to the developer, the VDC can only cause notes to be triggered later, not earlier. Since legato articulations have the longest latency, any other note can be triggered later relative to the lead time set for the legato articulation. Regarding my current legato lead setting, I'm telling the script, I want the triggered note to precede or lead ahead of the beat by 190 milliseconds. Since the negative delay set in Cubase's track already causes all notes to precede the beat by minus 190 milliseconds, setting the legato algorithm to a legato lead time of 190 milliseconds adds nothing. In other words, we are telling this algorithm that we want the note to be triggered 190 milliseconds earlier than the beat, and since the track's negative delay is already doing that, the script doesn't need to add any lead time to make the note trigger earlier. So minus 190 negative track delay plus 190 VDC lead time equals zero, meaning the note will be triggered 190 milliseconds earlier than the beat because of the negative track delay set in Cubase. Now, suppose I want staccato articulations to be triggered only 20 milliseconds before the beat, since they don't have much lag time. The negative delay I set in Cubase's track will cause all notes, legato, staccato and mute, to trigger 190 milliseconds earlier. In other words, the legato notes with a lag time of 190 milliseconds will now sound on the beat because of the track's negative delay setting but the staccato and mute articulations will now sound earlier than the beat since they have much lower lag times. So, if I want the staccato notes to be triggered only 20 milliseconds before the beat, I'll need to create a new algorithm for the MIDI channel that triggers the staccato articulation. I do this by clicking the add button and then clicking the drop down menu to select the algorithm with the same number as the MIDI channel I want to trigger. Since staccato articulations don't ever trigger legato scripting when overlapped I'll set a value of 20 milliseconds in the first lead field. In fact, I'm going to set the first lead only for any articulation that doesn't have legato. To get the staccato notes to be triggered 20 milliseconds before the beat, this algorithm will now cause the notes on the staccato MIDI channel to be triggered 170 milliseconds later. Put another way, since all notes are triggered 190 milliseconds earlier because of the negative delay set in the track, this algorithm triggers the notes on this MIDI channel 170 milliseconds later, so minus 190 plus 170 equals minus 20 milliseconds. This results in the notes being triggered 20 milliseconds before the beat, so the main part of the note sounds directly on the beat. Going back to the legato phrase now, the first note is not in time because there are no notes overlapping the start of it and therefore legato scripting is not triggered. So, if I return to algorithm 1 and set my first lead, or first note lead, to 60, this delays the first note only by triggering it 130 milliseconds later. 
So, minus 190 plus 130 equals minus 60 and this note will be triggered 60 milliseconds before the beat. Again, this only affects the first note in the legato phrase, the rest of the overlapped notes in the phrase will be delayed by the number set in the legato lead field. Notice how the first note in the phrase is now sounding on the beat. This corrects the timing for both the first note as well as any overlapped legato notes. I'd like to point out another great feature this script offers. If I go to the maximum velocity field on any algorithm and pull down the value a new field opens up. Some libraries have different latencies for the same articulation based on the velocity of the notes. For example, a library's articulation might have 190 milliseconds of legato lead time when velocities are higher than 64, but 80 milliseconds of legato lead time when velocities are at 64 or lower. This can be addressed using this feature. I'll pull the maximum velocity field down until it says 64, then enter 80 milliseconds into the new legato lead field. In this example, I'm telling the script that velocities from 65 to 127 should trigger 190 milliseconds of legato lead times while velocities from 0 to 64 should trigger 80 milliseconds of legato lead times. I can keep doing this for up to 8 different velocity ranges. The VDC requires the least amount of negative track delay possible so I'll be sure to set it based on my most sluggish articulation. And now, here's a bonus tip. Many of these triggering methods can be combined to make a more efficient setup. For example, libraries often have articulations that are similar, like straight mutes and harmon mutes, and I cringe at having to have more than one track for similar articulations. In this example, I'm using an expression map with the variable delay compensator. But notice the fifth articulation slot is an instrument bank. Since I only want to use one articulation space in contact for mutes, I've decided to make the articulation responding to MIDI channel 5 an instrument bank. In here I can load as many mute variations as I wish and then send program change messages to trigger which exact mute I'd like. This cuts down on tracks, dramatically reducing bloat in my template. Also, since the mute articulations are similar, it's likely that the latencies are similar and therefore the VDC settings will be similar too. These similar articulations will also most likely require the same EQ, if any. However, I have noticed that another program change message is required to return to the original mute upon repeat. Keep that in mind. When all is said and done, I'll probably settle on using expression maps with the VDC and instrument banks due to the ability to have markings and articulations transferred to notation software. Step 7. I'll need to try to define a consistent articulation order so I can switch between different orchestral sections and maintain some sort of dependable uniformity in the order of articulations. In my experience, the orchestral section with the largest variety of articulations is the strings while the section with the least variety of articulations is the brass. For this reason I'll use my brass libraries as a basis to set up the articulation order. I'll take an inventory of all my libraries at this point and try to find articulations that all three orchestral sections have. Some of this can be simplified by recognizing that some articulations resemble other articulations from different orchestra sections. For example, Cone Sordino in the strings is similar to Stopped in the French horns, and Flutter Tongue in the woodwinds is similar to Tremolo in the strings. I'll also have to decide which articulations I like from each library and which ones won't work. 
If a single articulation from one brass library doesn't sound good I could swap it out with the same articulation from a different brass library. However, if I replace that articulation with one from another library I might need to pan, EQ, and apply reverb to that articulation to get it to match the other articulations from my primary library. I'll also need to decide if there's a way to cut down on the number of useful articulations. For example, perhaps I can use my mod wheel to do a sforzando rather than have a patch that has one recorded into it. Finally, I'm going to try to keep the number of articulations per instrument down by deciding which ones are basic articulations and which ones are extra articulations. I may, however, leave one articulation slot for instrument-specific articulations which are common for that instrument. As far as the rest, lesser used articulations will be moved to another contact instance which will be added to my template later. This instance will remain disabled until needed. As I add instruments to my template I'll want to have a consistent protocol developed for key switches, key switch ranges, controllers, expression maps and colors. Some examples might be always going from long articulations to short articulations, always having your shortest notes as a D-sharp zero key switch, always having the low bass instruments start at C5, always triggering vibrato with CC number 21, and always having your expression maps routed the same way. I'll be primarily trying to develop a consistent protocol between the harmonic sections of the orchestra, namely the woodwinds, brass and strings. If this isn't entirely possible because of what's available in my libraries, at the very least I'll want to have a consistent protocol between the multiple libraries I have for a particular section. I might also have to settle for a similar protocol, but not exact, between sections. Step 8. Once I've chosen an articulation order, it's time to load articulations for each instrument into a contact instance. It's very important that I add these instruments as rack instruments rather than track instruments. This is because Cubase forgets its routing when disabling track instruments. This is a known bug and my friend Ted Perlman was good enough to explain that to me as well as walk me through how to set up a rack instrument. To open a rack instrument, I'll show the right zone and click the rack arrow. Then I'll select contact and click create. Here I'll name my instrument. Next, I'll right click on the new contact instance, select add track, and then select MIDI, adding the number of MIDI channels I'll need for the number of articulations I'll have. Once the MIDI tracks are added, verify they are all connected to the same contact instance by looking at the inspector. If I press the shift key while selecting all tracks that go with that instrument, I can assign them all at once by holding down shift with alt and selecting my target instrument in the output box. Now that I'm starting to load instruments, I'm going to pay particular attention to the length of the samples for each specific articulation and where the memory will be assigned for each one as I described in the episode, optimizing sample players. Anyway, I hope these template videos have been useful to you in some way. I'm going to be very busy with other things for a while, not the least of which is building my new template, so the next template video won't be for quite a while but there's so much more I'm going to go through in regards to this template. It will also take you a very long time to put your own template together if you're following along with me. As you might expect, all the videos on my channel take some time to make so if you enjoy them and would like to see more I hope you'll consider supporting me by buying me a coffee at the link in the description below. Subscribing and sharing these videos with others is also greatly appreciated. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this template video series so far and please be sure to check out my other playlists for more educational resources. All the best to you and, as always, I'd love to hear any questions or comments you might have. Hey, thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like and leave a comment below if you have any questions. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button.